Thanks for joining us on our live stream again this morning. I uh, really appreciate you being with us. Uh, we're going to talk about sleep. Um, as you see on the board, insomnia, sleep dysfunction. Uh, the, what I'm going to talk about today, does it have to be full-blown insomnia, meaning I don't sleep at all? No, not really. Sleep dysfunction, latent sleep difficulties, I can't get to sleep or I fall asleep and I awaken or my sleep is broken throughout the course of the night. All of those can still create not just insomnia, but sleep disturbances that are chronic in nature, ongoing, can create a lot of health issues. So we're going to talk about the triggers, we're going to talk about the consequences, and we're going to talk about the answers. It'll be broken up into three phases. Triggers, consequences of poor sleep, not to scare you. Uh, but just a statement, statement of fact to encourage you to do some things to try to change and to alter um, that sleep process. And can you need to be encouraged, firstly, can you alter that sleep process? No doubt. No doubt about it. We want to get into the mechanics of that and how we can help you today or a family member. If you have a wife or a spouse, your husband, or maybe one of your children, and this may not be all-encompassing. I always tell you that every week when we do these programs, they may not cover every single aspect of a sleep disturbance. I may not hit on every single component, and I don't intend to do that in these teachings. They're meant to cover a broad, bra um, a broad spectrum of thought processes, getting you to think along these lines, open up your thought process, and maybe we might have to deal with you individually and specifically to help you get to maybe your specific root issue. I'm going to... Um, as we get into this, I want to um, read you just a, a little something about contentment and, and ease or peace of mind. Ease of mind, mentally, emotionally satisfied, willing to accept the circumstances with a course of action. Peace of mind, contentment. Why would I use that word? Because I believe to some degree, um, as I tie this to sleep, uh, in part is, I, I just feel that many of us lack contentment in our lives. We lack peace. Now, the Bible calls Jesus the Prince of Peace. And many of us need to, first of all, make and connect or reconnect or establish that relationship with the Prince of Peace. But I want to read you a couple things as you just you know, go to the back of your Bible and you just go through a... Um, whatever they call this, a little bit of a concordance at the back, rest. Genesis 49, 15, he saw that rest was good. Exodus 33, and I will give thee rest. Isaiah 11, rest shall be glorious. Isaiah 18, I will take my rest. Verse, excuse me, chapter 30, verse 15, returning and resting. Isaiah 66, the place of my rest. Micah 2, is not your rest. Zechariah 1.11, and is at rest. I mean, there are tons of references. I want to go in and pull each one of those for you. But I just want to give you, there's a lot of scriptural um, implications to the word rest. And I would encourage you... Uh, maybe to start there and beginning to read a psalm. Let me read you Psalm 23. As we did the radio show today, we talked about uh, the psalms. And I'm going to talk about over the next few days, Psalm 22, 23, and 24, how he's our good shepherd, um, how he's our great shepherd and referenced um, in the Bible, and then how he's our kingly shepherd or chief shepherd in chapter 24 of the psalms. But he will return in ruling and reigning, um, he will be the glorious ruler and reigner um, on this earth. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still or quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest or the shadow of the valley of death, depending on the interpretation, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows, and surely goodness 
and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. There can be a lot of interpretations, a lot of different directions um, that you can take on Psalm 23. But I think the general theme is, is one of us getting out of leaning and depending upon ourselves and learning on a day-to-day relationship to lean and to depend upon Him. I believe the first place to, or the first point to deal with contentment or lack of contentment and finding rest in your life is being in this position, in a worshipful praise position and surrendering and submitting more and more of our own individual desires in our own life for His glory and submitting and surrendering to Him. Look up the meaning of contentment and just get a grip on that. Look up some of the scriptural references, not just for sleep. I believe it's rest. A lot of us just don't have peace, contentment. In essence, we cannot rest, often leading to difficulties with sleep dysfunction. So that's the spiritual side of it. Now we want to talk about the functional side of this. Why do we have so many issues with sleep? Well, I uh, went ahead and put a few of them right up here. I already have them written up here for you. What are some of the triggers? Artificial sweeteners. We did a whole dissertation on that last week. Artificial sweeteners can be stimulatory to your brain neurologically. Number two, food allergies, food intolerances are a big trigger for sleep disturbances. We always think of food allergies. Well, I have hives, I have rash, I broke out in... uh, you know, a, a red, blotchy, itchy, hivey like reaction. I No, you can get headaches, migraines, eczema. You can have sleep disturbances from food intolerances. Cortisol, high cortisol, high stress. We're under a lot of stress. High stress hormones can absolutely impair the body's ability to make melatonin. Here's how this works. If you're producing a lot of cortisol or stress hormones at night, you will drop your melatonin production. See, these things operate like this. What you have is cortisol should be higher early in the day, and as the day goes on into the evening, it drops to a low point. Your melatonin is very, very low early in the day, And as the day secedes, as it goes on, it's supposed to rise. In essence, they are equal and opposite of one another. It's impossible to have both your cortisol and your melatonin high at one time. So what would we do here? We'd want to do a cortisol assessment on you. If you're battling sleep issues, whether it's insomnia or just some generalized sleep dysfunction, we'd want to get a cortisol, maybe even a melatonin level. In the evening, at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. Why? To see if you're following this pattern. Because if your cortisol is doing this at night, your melatonin is dropping. You'll never sleep. Okay? So, stress, cortisol, they all tie. High stress, high cortisol, dropping and lowering levels of melatonin. How about alcohol consumption? Most people think and have gotten duped, maybe not you personally, but family members. You might even have a youngster, you might have a teen that is drinking and is drinking more heavily and thinking that it's helping them sleep. Well, mom, I just do it because. Dad, I, you know, it helps me sleep. I can't sleep at night. It helps me to rest. Really? Really? Well, here's what we know about alcohol. Alcohol, I call the great deceiver because what it will do is alcohol will calm and activate some of those GABA receptors in the brain. But as the alcohol wears off, there's an abrupt withdrawal, cessation, pulling away from those calming brain receptors. Hence, it leaves you high and dry. So there might be an initial reduction of inhibition. There might be an initial calming relaxation effect. But the longer scope is, as it drops, you're left very much in more of an agitated state. We also know that alcohol robs the body of the abilities uh, to use your bees efficiently. You will use all of your bees to process alcohol, and then indirectly you can't make your own brain neurotransmitters 
to produce a sense of calm so that you can sleep. Alcohol is a great deceiver. Uh, many people use it to help them get to sleep. They think that's the mechanism. Two, three, four hours into sleep, there's an abrupt rejection or going in the other direction of that scenario. Restless leg syndrome. Some folks battle restless leg syndrome. Um, chronic involuntary movements of the legs. For the years, we thought it was a dopamine issue in the periphery. So we use medications some even structurally related to treating Parkinson's disease, and we use them to treat pharmacologically uh, restless leg syndrome to help people sleep. The reality of it is it's excessive glutamate, too much stimulatory components in the brain. That's really where we have to burrow down onto. So a lot of this ties together, and I'll explain glutamate in a few minutes. Pain. Some people are in chronic pain. I, notice I have a few of these checked. I have a few checked because I believe some of these things that I have checked are things that we can control as far as the trigger component of this. I believe that the ones that I don't have checked per se, I guess I could check restless leg, um, I can't control. If I have a chronic pain syndrome because I have a bad back or I have a, a torn rotator cuff, we've got to somehow manage your pain situation I, I, that I can't, I don't believe we can necessarily alter. The big check marks are things that I think you can modify and certainly change. Hypoglycemia. Many of you are suffering from reactive hypoglycemia, meaning that your blood sugars are in essence dropping um, during the course of the night. All right? Many of you are insulin resistant. You eat poorly, honestly. You make bad decisions from a dietary standpoint, you eat too many carbs, you eat too much sugar, so that your blood sugars are you know, relatively high at, at a stage, whatever, 9, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night because you've eaten and you've had some snacks. And then what happens, getting into 2, 3, 4 in the morning, your blood sugars are beginning to drop. Reactive hypoglycemia, your blood sugar drops, you know what you do? You start punching out cortisol. Cortisol is stimulatory. It will awaken you. So even your diet. Oh, wait a minute. Is that a food allergy? No, 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 no. Food allergies are different. Those should be defined. If we, if we go through this whole cross-section and we can't get to your sleep disturbances, then we've got to look at food allergy. This is totally different. This, you know, If you're eating a bowl of ice cream at 1030 or you're eating cake and cookies at 10.30 at night, you could be triggering rising blood sugars, blood sugar drops, cortisol in response to a blood sugar drop. You, you, you release stimulatory catecholamines and cortisol, stimulates you, awakens you, all right? So hopefully, I, I, I try, and if you guys have some comments on this, first of all, you can go, to, uh, you can go right to the website, um, obviously where you are. And if you want to ask some questions, you can certainly fire away at some questions at us at orders at uh, AskJoeDematti or, or support at AskJoeDematti.com right on the website. Uh, Josiah's here. Josiah will, will pick up the questions and I'll try to um, answer them. When I do these, I'm trying not to get too technical. I'm trying to keep this in a, a format that is understandable and doable but I apologize, but sometimes I can't do it without explaining to you what's going on. Back, what's the background noise? What's the biochemistry? What is your chemistry? What's happening to you? So I hope that you understand that. So when I, when I explain, you know, hypo, reactive hypoglycemia, and you see me doing stuff like that, I'm just trying to explain to you what's happening so that you don't think, oh, well, I just caught insomnia. No, you didn't catch it. I just got insomnia. No, you didn't. You don't just got insomnia. Well, you know, my mother had insomnia, so I... No, you, you don't just have it. Well, I'm just a light sleeper. Well, you could be semi-light sleeper. I, I, I get that. But you should be getting to REM and non-REM phases and sleep because... Why? Because that's how God made our bodies. That's what's supposed to happen. And I'll, I'll get into some of the downsides of when you don't get into those phases. So if I get into these little explanations with you, there's a reason. I don't have a check mark next to depression and anxiety because many of you are suffering from depression and have high anxiety states 
due to a lot of things, troubled children, maybe a bad marriage, maybe financial problems, maybe a loss of a business, loss of a loved one. I, I, I can't make that, I can't change that for you. We can do some things that maybe alter your neurochemistry to help you. But again, the ones I have check marks to me are directly modifiable. If I drink too much caffeine, that can be a very easily modifiable risk factor that is troubling you, maybe not with insomnia, but a level of sleep dysfunction. Uh, I don't have a check mark next to medications. Why? Because some of you are using medications. Some of you are using drugs as an example known as beta blockers. Maybe for a heart condition, maybe for blood pressure. What, what, what do beta blockers do? Beta blockers, they slow down the heart rate. They slow down the impulses, the electrical stimulus coming to the heart. That's a simplification. They do other things too, even uh, to, the, uh, to your respiratory system, to your lungs as well. But beta blockers drop coenzyme Q production, number one, in case you didn't know that, not just statins. Uh, number two, ouch, it reduces melatonin. So you could have been on a beta blocker for six, seven years, maybe after a stents or bypass, and wonder why the last five or six years you haven't been sleeping well. It could be directly related to the beta blocker, but we can't necessarily change that because I can't tell you to go off of your medication per se. So I say that's not a modifiable risk factor. But what can we do? We can f do a melatonin level on you and see if that is in part your issue. Is that making some sense? Hopefully that makes some sense to you. Hey, if you got a question, go to the website, fire away. Josiah will give me the uh, iPad. We're so techy around here. Thank God, thank God Josiah has me to handle all the technical aspects of everything that we do. Uh, <laughs> Once again, I want to thank you for tuning in. And hey, if you enjoy what you're, you're learning um, on these live streams, make sure that you have uh, one of your friends, maybe one of your family members. doesn't matter where they are. They can tune in. They can be in... They can be in England, for goodness sake. Get on the internet and tune us in. Um, I guess you could, right? Whether you're in England or whatever. All right. Global, global. We're global. All right. Depression, anxiety. I'm saying that I can't necessarily control that issue for you. That I don't have a check mark there, but that can be leading, <clears throat> certainly, to your issues. Why? Well, there could be a lot of reasons. The depression and anxiety. Let me just give you a quick um, overview of that your serotonin levels could be dropping. Serotonin produces a sense of calm. Your glutamate levels could be rising in response to depression and anxiety. Your dopamine levels could be dropping. Your GABA brain, these are all brain, <clears throat> you make these in other parts of the body too, but I'm gonna, for sake of today, they're brain neurotransmitters, they're brain chemicals. Glutamate's rising, serotonin is dropping, GABA is dropping, end result, you don't sleep. Or you have broken sleep, or you have these um, components of, I, I don't feel rested when I sleep, I can't get into deep sleep, I feel like I'm waking up every half an hour to an hour I'm very light in my sleep. If I hear the slightest noise, I'm, a lot of times it's because these neurotransmitters, these brain chemicals are off. And it's a result sometimes of depression and anxiety and, and, and other things. It doesn't have to just be depression and anxiety. Hormones, <clears throat> modifiable risk factor. You could be a guy <clears throat> and your testosterone levels are dropping. You could be a woman and you've gone through menopause and your estrogen and progesterone levels are dropping. Huge problem. Progesterone that's diminished, progesterone has a calming effect on your brain. If your progesterone levels are dropping, women, problems with sleep. So, I don't know that I covered it all, but I think that um, I've covered the, 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 the major port portion of the triggers, excuse me, that I wanted to cover today. There's, there's more, I'm sure. And someone more sophisticated in their approach than me might, um, <clears throat> excuse me, talk about. I, I want to, I, I want to make sure that you understand the ABC. So let's talk about now some of the consequences. So we talked about the triggers. Let's go into the consequences. All right. What are the consequences? Low human growth hormone. Number one. Uh, number two. 
increases the risk of osteoporosis, uh, alters your hormone levels, okay? Causes you to be insulin resistant. You've heard me talk about this, causing increased weight gain. Increases the risk when you don't sleep. What are the consequences? Um, causing uh, difficulties with not only sleep, but with, excuse me, that'd be poor repair. Weight gain. Um, losing my train of thought here. Huh? <clears throat> Hypertension. High blood pressure. Increasing rates of cardiovascular disease and increase the risk for diabetes. Human growth hormone, why is that important? That's how you repair, that's how you recover. You make human growth hormone, your body is actually repairing. I would say the little worker bees come out. I don't make adequate human growth hormone, I can't even repair my brain. Do you realize that when you sleep, that is the key time for your brain to do the work of repair? Melatonin is generally impaired. You say, wait a minute, I thought that was a trigger, uh, but watch it here now. Because <clears throat> as I'm sleeping poorly, I'm up, I'm in the bathroom, I got lights on, put my light, nightstand light on, I begin to shut down pineal gland production of melatonin. Melatonin protects, revitalizes your brain. Melatonin doesn't just, we have so simplified. Oh, yeah, I know what melatonin is. Even medical people. Huh? Melatonin, yeah, what helps you to sleep. Well, you can take a little bit of melatonin. Don't take too much melatonin because melatonin will then <clears throat> cause a disruption of your hormone patterns and whatever. Bottom line is, huh, I don't sleep well. I don't make enough melatonin. Maybe as a result of poor sleep now, not only just as a cause, and I reduce the protective mechanisms. Therefore, I have more rapid brain aging. Uh, what do you mean by more rapid brain? It means that you have higher rates of dementia, more rapid mental decline when you don't sleep at night because you're losing the ability to repair. Documented increasing rates <coughs> of osteoporosis and immune dysfunction. Do you know that it's documented with poor sleep and impaired sleep patterns that progenitor cells, I'm going to get into that, a little too techy. Progenitor cells are increased. Progenitor cells are involved in disease induction in your body. So here's what we have so far. Poor human growth hormone production when I don't sleep, so I don't repair physically, I don't repair my brain. Melatonin can drop as a result of poor sleep, not only as a cause, but as a result. Therefore, I don't repair my brain. I can alter my hormone levels. I become more insulin resistant. It's easier for me to gain weight. My repair mechanisms can go down. I'll have higher rates of high blood pressure, heart disease, increasing rates of diabetes. And let me see if there's anything else. Heart failures associated with it. Inflammation. How could I forget that? When you don't sleep, you are more inflamed. Say, well, I've just learned to live with it. Well, I've worked with a couple people, certainly, uh, that have, it's always been very frustrating for me <clears throat> that we've not been able to rectify their sleep issues, unfortunately. It's a handful. It's a couple. Um, and sometimes, I don't know, that, there's some things that I believe, certainly, I, I don't know. I don't know everything here. There are some things I don't know that we even know about the chemistry, really, of sleep yet and why some people can't achieve consistent or deep and REM sleep. I don't want to get into REM and non-REM. That's where your body goes through rapid eye movement and so on. I, I don't want to, just don't want to go there. I, I think the, the issue is here, what's happening as a result, you need to know that it's not okay to just accept the fact that I don't sleep well because it's going to damage my immune system Cancer rates are higher in people that do not sleep well, breast cancer in women, um, higher levels of inflammation, I'm at a higher risk for blood pressure and heart disease and diabetes, I'm typically going to pack on the pounds, I don't repair, I don't repair my brain, whew, some pretty serious consequences I would say. I mean, I, 
I mean, that, and, and that's, that's the short list. I mean, to me, that's, those are the big visible components to this. Um, and, and before I would look at going to any greater detail, I don't think it serves us any purpose. If this is a not enough motivation to get you to begin to look at why you're not sleeping well at a deeper level, <clears throat> not just taking Ambien. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about meds. Do you know that actually the medications that are typically used um, to just to try to knock you out, uh, for example, drugs like Ambien and so on, see, when, when you don't encourage sleep through a natural manner, sleep meds, oh, they may just knock you out, but they do not allow you to go through the, all the processes that we talked about, repair and so on, because you're doing it in a very, very, very artificial manner. They tried to come out with a drug a few years ago, Rosarum, uh, that's kind of a, I believe, a mimic to melatonin. We call melatonin agonist to activate the receptors in your brain um, that, that are like melatonin structurally. Let's get to the mechanics of why we're here, and that's really the ultimate answer. We're going to go to a break in just a minute. Um, you want to ask some questions, fire away. Orders at, uh, or support at AskJoeDiMatteo.com. You're right on the website. I would encourage you, when at the end of the day, uh, Josiah will put this up. Uh, it'll be uploaded to the website so that you can go back and rewatch this. And you say, well, that was too boring. I don't want to go watch this, but I know that... Um, you know, my sister has some sleep problems. She hasn't been sleeping well, and we don't know what the problem is. Um, she needs to watch it, or my brother-in-law, I don't know, turn somebody on to it. Let them watch us. I mean, this is a very, very functional, structural process to improving your sleep. We're going to go to a break. I want you to stay with us. We come back. Now, we've covered consequences. We've covered triggers, and when we come back, we're going to kind of go into some answers. You know, we always hold the answers to the end. Stay tuned. Stay with us. Enjoy the worship tape. Ready to rock. Let's roll. I hope you enjoyed that worship uh, CD. I know I would enjoy them. Josiah has them playing here for us. Um, I I'm just going to read you something. Because the more I go through this, you just continue to realize that there has to be so much more. Certainly, we're here to try to help you deal with the brain chemistry and the neurochemistry and the, all the the potential triggers and the problems and why you got to get rid of artificial sweeteners and aspartame and why you got to really watch um, processed foods that have a lot of preservatives because they're stimulatory to the brain and why you're going to have to watch your caffeine intake. So we've, we've got all that. I think we've got all that covered, you know. The part that, that we need to really cover maybe is this, and I just want you to just get a theme here as I read through this. In you, Lord God, my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. Guide me in your truth and teach me for you are God my Savior. My hope is in you all day long. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He guides the humble in what is right and he teaches them in his way. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. The Lord confides. He puts confidence. He puts trust in those who reverence him, who fear him. Really, <clears throat> if you go through this, you know, it's a prayer for defense and protection and all of that. But it's all about us learning to put our trust and confidence in him, letting him teach us. It's all about him. Ultimately, as we get into this position, one of humility and reverence, God teaches us. The Bible teaches us right here that he confides in us, that he shows confidence in us. He reveals to us, and specifically, it says that he reveals his covenant. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for he will release my feet from the snare. Now notice that. The snare is on our feet. The psalmist doesn't say my eyes are on my snare. My eyes are always on the Lord and he will release my feet from the snare. It's ultimately always about him. Hey, I've got a couple things coming up. Uh, Josiah reminded me, May 10th, we have a health fair. 
We have an open house, whatever you want to call it. I'm not going to really do any real teaching that day. <clears throat> I do enough of that six days a week on the radio broadcast. These formats, we've got blogs that we've done. We've got multiple teachings out there. And every week, we're pounding out these live streams. We're just going to engage. You can come into the offices. We'll have specials running. Um, ask questions. My whole staff will be here. My son will be here. My son, my daughter will be here. Josiah will be here. We're going to be doing some filming. We'll be talking to you folks. <clears throat> We're going to do some live stream. Exactly. For those of you that are out of the area, thank you. That's why you're here. I know that's why you're here, brother. Here's what we're going to do. He is good for lots, not just good for something. Uh, Josiah is actually going to be doing some live streaming that day. So that as we're out there engaging and talking to folks, Josiah is going to go around and actually you'll be able to live stream that event that day. And you'll be able to literally tune in and see and talk. Literally, you'll be able to obvert some of the conversations. And so you'll get a, you'll get a flavor. <clears throat> Answering questions. We'll do whatever we got to do that way. And I'll engage. That's right. Our chiropractor is going to be here, Seth. So we got a lot going on that day, May 10th. I believe that's obviously it's a Saturday. Uh, go to the website to get the details. We've got some specials running for you right now. And I know I'm dating the broadcast and the program by doing so, but too bad. So what? Um, go to the website. What's that? We've always got some specials. We've got some things running for you. Make sure that you go to the website. Take advantage of them uh, before they run out. Quick question. Are there any drug treatments for Raynaud? Specifically, I'm a nursing mother who's experiencing Raynaud's for the first time. I've heard calcium and magnesium may also help. Um, Raynaud's, if it is truly autoimmune in nature, there's not a whole lot even from a pharmacology standpoint. They use medications known as calcium channel blockers to open up your arterial walls and beds. But if it is related more to an autoimmune process, I'm not even so sure that we get a lot of relief from um, calcium channel blockers. I don't really know of another medication really that is used um, to treat Raynaud's. I believe there's some literature on carnitine. We use a more natural approach. We'll use something like a Perfusia Plus that helps naturally raise nitric oxide to relax the arterial beds. Carnitine, um, off the top of my head, I would definitely get a vitamin D level. Raynaud's is autoimmune. So I would always take you back to the source and to the root. How do we modify an autoimmune process? Do you have a gluten intolerance? Gluten intolerance really predisposes you to autoimmune conditions. Do you have vitamin D deficiencies? Your vitamin D, even if it's in low normal, if you have a little bit of a genetic leaning, you're def if you're low in D, it allows for the expression. Okay, so that opens the door. It's not, it's not the cause of your disease, but it makes you susceptible. Um, probably put you on elimination diet. I put you on mega doses of essential fatty acids, anti-inflammatory. Raynaud's is an autoimmune inflammatory process. Now, I don't care what anybody tells you anywhere. It, it's, it's autoimmune and it is inflammatory. We would try to reduce the inflammation, use a couple key supplements, and I know why the carnitine keeps coming to my head on that one. I think we got another one here. Um, has, have had fibromyalgia, <coughs> excuse me, chronic fatigue, and sleep issues for year, need, years. Need advice on some supplements. This is Kathy. Um, should I schedule a consult? I think you should schedule a consult because fibro and chronic fatigue, I believe, have a lot of roots. They have a, roots that link all the way down to uh, poor cellular energetics. There could be some thyroid issues, certainly, that are involved here as well. Ultimately, poor detoxification uh, mechanisms are associated, and you've had, notice what you said. Kathy says, I've had sleep issues for years. I need some advice. When you don't sleep, what I say before, you don't repair. See, poor sleep opens the doors to things like chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, because at its very root, when you don't sleep, certainly you don't repair. Thanks so much. I, I would suggest that you, you set up a time uh, with Joyce or myself, the nurse practitioner, why? Just so we can maybe not have all your answers, but get you on a path, give you a, a protocol. <clears throat> a gal that called on the program earlier on the radio broadcast and had a lot of fears about certain things that she has been battling and also some concerns from her past history. And certainly um, we're always afraid of what we don't know. The, the, the dark areas are what we certainly fear. And what I encouraged her to do is to begin to look at what her other 
uh, potential triggers were, define them. And, and made the statement not to strike more fear into you that it's doomsday, that those are modifiable components. Her lipoprotein A, her C-reactive protein, an MTHFR level. If it's high, you've got to modify that because that puts you at a higher risk for clogging up your artery. So I know that's off of the subject, but it's not. The principle is have some labs done. Let us kind of educate you, give you the direction that hopefully begins to help you not be fearful and enclose your thought process, but open your thought process so that you can engage. Back to sleep. <clears throat> no single answer. So what's that supposed to mean? Improving your sleep doesn't have a single answer to it. I, I don't believe um, that there's one singular component. I believe that it's um, getting to the multiple points of this, <clears throat> excuse me, and attempting to define um, what we can do. So, so number one, I would say that we, we need, need to think about some neurotransmitter testing. Now, I mean, I'm going to give you some options when we're, at, when we're done here. Just You can take X, Y, Z to just see how you do with the sleep process. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> but if you've had an ongoing, long-term sleep disorder, maybe not full-blown insomnia, but just chronic sleep issues, we should really look at trying to figure out what your levels of gamma aminobutyric acid are, GABA, what your dopamine levels are, and you can do all this with a simple urine test. It gives you a good idea where you are, maybe not exactly, but it gives you a good framework. <clears throat> what your serotonin production is, we should absolutely do a cortisol level, you do that with saliva, we want to know what a melatonin level is. So remember before I gave you that little pictorial and showed you that <clears throat> this is what happens. Cortisol should be dropping at night, melatonin rises. Remember, they cannot exist in the same plane at the same time. It's imp physically impossible. It's not the way your body was made. So if cortisol is rising and you want to go to sleep, and it's 11 o'clock at night, and you're distressed, and cortisol is going through the roof, your melatonin's dropping like a rock. You'll never sleep. <clears throat> How do we correct that? Well, we got to try to temper the cortisol production. We could use L-theanine. We could use phosphatidylserine. So there are some things to temper the cortisol production, uh, and I believe there's a lot of other things you can do. And then we might use some supplemental melatonin to try to counteract is melatonin for everybody that doesn't sleep? Not necessarily. All right, so neurotransmitter testing. Define your GABA levels, dopamine, serotonin. Why? What would you do with it? You say, well, I don't know anything about that. Well, then, if you're deficient, let's say here and here, we can give you some precursors and some things that activate these two components to help you with your sleep. If you're elevated here, I just gave you the thought process how we want to try to reduce it. If you're low here, in other words, now you have points of intervention. There are some things that you can do and not just take a, a, a sedative or a hypnotic. You're actually dealing with, hopefully, the issues. Exercise. If you don't exercise and you have poor sleep, uh, you need to consider some exercise. Um, actually, the literature shows the more intense your exercise, the better you sleep. The only qualifier is don't do it within three to five hours of attempting to go to sleep. Um, I think some deep breathing at times. Some deep breathing. And I'm not going to get into how you do that right now, but what it does, you exchange your gases better. Your CO2, you release CO2, and you increase your oxygen. So when I do deep breathing and I slow down my respiration, I oxygenate my cells better, I make my neurotransmitters better, I release C CO2, I become less acidic, okay? And I actually then will produce more relaxation when I am doing this because I'm actually going to make more serotonin very naturally. I also think that besides the breathing, um, I, I think you start reading some psalms at night. I think you start doing some things that are actually um, relaxing and calming to you. Salt and soda baths. 
Many of you just need to take a salt and soda bath. Uh, some of you might even have um, saunas. I have, a, I have a sauna in my home. Do, do a sauna. It's very relaxing. Salt and soda baths, uh, sea salts, baking soda, very, very absolutely relaxing. So as we cover a couple of these areas right now, you know, we're trying to find out <clears throat> from a neurotransmitter standpoint where my neurotransmitters are imbalanced. But I do believe there's other very basic things. You, you don't eat a large meal late at night. You don't eat a lot of carbs and sugars late at night. You try to eat a very light, small snack, higher in protein and fat. Don't eat a large meal. Why? Because it really makes your digestive process work. It's very stimulatory. Uh, don't engage a difficult situation or conversation late at night that can wait until tomorrow or that you didn't deal with early in the day. Don't wait till 10 o'clock at night to make that call or that conversation. <clears throat> Why? Because it's stimulatory. You'll raise your cortisol. Okay? So these, I believe, and I've tried to cover, let's make sure I covered some things. Um, I, I think that if you've got some underlying depressive issues and anxiety issues, Certainly, I believe that ultimately those things need to be dealt with as well. Um, but if you drink and you're drinking heavily, um, I, I, what I and also over the long term, we find that high alcohol consumption reduces the body's ability to make serotonin, which is a calming brain neurotransmitter. So I know I've kind of covered this pretty quickly. Exercise, how you eat. You gotta watch your triggers, processed foods, chemicals in foods, the amount of caffeine. Don't drink alcohol late at night. You might have to cut caffeine out altogether. Watch the amount of foods that have preservatives, aspartame. They are very stimulatory to your brain. So now let's just talk about some key supplements. We have essential sleep. We have products like Essential Sleep, Cabin Ace PM. This is very, very similar to that. But you've got natural agents in here, things like taurine, um, four amino butyric acid, which is a more body-ready form of GABA so that it crosses the blood-brain barrier. A little bit of melatonin. It has L5-HTP, which is a precursor to serotonin. So you can see a couple of the things that we have in this prep are geared to trying to modify some of those brain neurotransmitters that help you sleep. Taurine is an amino acid. Taurine is converted to GABA in your body. You need the Bs. The Bs are critically helpful to aiding your sleep process. Why we use the coenzymed form of Bs. We also, in some cases, will use niacinamide. Niacinamide has natural anti-anxiety-like effects on the body. Niacinamide can actually act like a benzodiazepine in the body at high enough doses. What's a benzodiazepine? Drugs like Xanax, Ativan, Lorazepam. Um, that's how niacinamide can, can work. So we have essential sleep that can be helpful. In some cases, we might need to layer in a little bit of a product called phosphatidylserine with that because that can be helpful to temper cortisol production. Now remember, essential sleep has a little bit of melatonin. It has the absorbable form of GABA. It has L5-HTP, so taurine. So it's a combination prep that is designed to try to meet a lot of these brain neuro uh, pathways. Um, you also have the potential and the option to use something even like an L-theanine. If, you ha if you're very racy, if your mind is always racing, um, L-theanine has the ability, and we have a nice extract of L-theanine, um, has the ability to alter alpha and beta waves, which the only compound that we know of, there's no medication that can do this, and there's certainly no other natural agent, and I always get the two reversed, the alpha and beta waves. Um, one is more stimulatory, increases alertness, the other one is calming. That theanine has the ability to do both. It actually upregulates your focus and technically your concentration and also at the same time has a calming effect. Everything pharmaceutically or naturally does one or the other. This is the only agent that can affect both pathways at one time. Have a calming effect yet enhance your, 
your focus, your concentration, but it's not stimulatory. So essential sleep, phosphatidylserine, maybe a little bit of L-theanine, and one that I always love, and I use a lot of this myself, are mag essentials. Why? Magnesium counterbalances a lot of the stimulatory brain neurotransmitters. I think we've covered a good bit. I know we're well over our, our time that we want to try to use here. I hope this has helped you. I kind of went through this portion pretty quickly, um, but <clears throat> caffeine, cut it out. Artificial dyes and colors, cut them out. Exercise. If you don't even just walk, you need to start walking, but don't do three hours of exercise starting at 8.30 at night. I mean, there's things that you need to engage and then use some natural supplements to help you. And ultimately, if we're still not getting results, then you need to do a, a urinary neurotransmitter test and do a saliva hormone panel. Let's evaluate your cortisol levels, your DHEA levels, and your melatonin levels. Why? Because if they are inverted, they will absolutely disrupt your sleep. So I'm going to go back to this. There's no single answer. There's no one single answer. Use some key supplements, engage in some of the things we talked about, do some deep breathing for four or five minutes before you go to bed, read a psalm, calming, encouraging, and use your preps. If we don't get results, then we need to look at some neurotransmitter, urinary testing, some saliva testing to hopefully get to the root and really try to modify the process. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget, um, we'll be live streaming our event uh, in May here, our open house. You'll be able to tune in no matter where you are and get a flavor for what's going on. A couple of weeks, two Saturdays from now, exactly. Uh, we have some specials running now. Go to the website, take advantage of them. They'll be running out soon, quickly. Um, God bless you. Thanks for being with you with us and have a blessed, blessed day. Thank you. <music>